Welcome to the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast, where we talk with martial arts practitioners about their histories and the influence that their practice of martial arts has on their lives. You are listening to the free version of this podcast, which is abbreviated. Help support this program by considering to subscribe to us on Patreon, where you will get four full-length podcasts each month, one week before the YouTube release date. The cost is that of about one coffee shop coffee per month. Go to www.patreon.com slash malmag to subscribe. That is www.patreon.com slash M-A-L-M-A-G. If you would like to purchase single full-length episodes of the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast, visit our Gumroad page at malmag.gumroad.com. And that is M-A-L-M-A-G dot G-U-M-R-O-A-D dot com. This week I get on Zoom and connect to Indiana, and I talk with Patrick Kelly, who is the director of the extensive martial art program at Indiana University. We talk about his martial arts background, choreographing fight scenes for film and television, and much more. Sit back and enjoy. Welcome to the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast, and today I've got a very interesting gentleman that I met. Uh, several years back, actually, at the UCLA martial arts uh, talk function. And um, I'm familiar with him from before. We had met online through mutual friends and stuff. And um, this guy's just such an interesting guy that I've been kind of after him for a while, looking for a free moment in his busy schedule to get him on here. And uh, I think many of you will recognize some of the work that he does. And I think we'll really enjoy getting to know him a little better. This is Patrick Kelly from Indiana actually how's Welcome it going to the show sir oh very good you, very sir. good happy happy to get you on here actually yeah fine thank you very much yeah, it's it's uh it, i've been following you guys for a while and uh, obviously uh, knowing paul and, and katie and Anson and a bunch of people who have come from here out there it's uh it, it's finally good to sit down and talk with you yeah. in long form rather rather than that that quick and uh quick and crazy ucla uh um event yeah, yeah. Chaos. I mean, that was real enjoyable because I think up to that time, we'd only just sort of exchanged right. Um, right. messages. I mean, you know, the, the yeah. wonder of technology, it's really great. You kind of get to know people now yeah. at a distance. And yeah. uh, there's several people and, and, I know this way. And then you, you finally get to either talk to them live, you know, in, a, in something like this or in yeah. person. And it's, it's actually yeah. quite enjoyable because you feel like you've already known them for a while. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it, it, technology makes the world smaller, man. It's pretty cool. Exactly. In a good, in a good way. In a good way. Indeed. Yeah. Well, let's let's um real quick just kind of I think yeah. maybe uh get into what you do so people are kind of familiar. Sure. Then, then we'll go backwards as to how you got started in, in martial arts and all of it. But um Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so I mean currently I'm the uh, martial arts program director uh for Indiana University here in delightful Bloomington, Indiana. Uh <laughs> the, it says the, the delightful, <laughs> and I'm I'm pretty sure he means that sincerely. And not I, I know I do. <laughs> I, 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 bo- a bit of both, yes. A bit of both. Uh, next week, when the students get back, it'll be a lot more sarcastic sounding. Uh, but this week, it's actually quite nice and, and quiet here. So, um, yeah. So the, the program here has been running since uh, 1965. Uh, it was started by a gentleman named Don Burns, who was uh, involved with U.S. Judo back in the day, and pretty much all we really had in this area back in the day in the 60s was judo and karate or, or taekwondo whichever one however, however it was marketed to the to the commercial schools um and he just started teaching judo here uh at iu um for the students kind of a recreational and then added uh taekwondo specifically taekwondo and then added after that hapkido which is a not a traditional korean hapkido it was a little more progressive uh and with a lot more judo added to it because that was his wheelhouse uh, and then he just built it up from there. Uh, I came here in 88 and started taking lessons um, uh, in basically from him in, um, um, I'm trying to think, probably 1990. Uh, and eventually got the job once he retired out. And uh, so I run the program uh, in 2006. We had the most enrollments, we record enrollments, and we were actually asked to taper the enrollments down again because we actually had too many people in the program. Wow. We weren't seeing enough, mo- we weren't seeing enough support money from the university, but we had uh, 15, about 1,550 enrollments each semester. So about 3,000 students the, that year. 
uh, coming through, our, yeah, coming through our program. Uh, and so facility management and everything else caused us to kind of dial it back down again. But I'm pretty proud to say we're the, we're the largest academic martial arts program in the nation, except for West Point. But at West Point, uh, it's compulsory. If you go to West Point, you're taking a, you know, a, a boxing class, self-defense class, jiu-jitsu class, combatives class. But uh, for elective um, martial arts, we're the, we're the largest academic uh, program in the nation right now. We have, um, what do we have for enrollments this semester? We have 1,100 enrollments this semester. Wow. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're going to be busy. I, that's something I think, you know, when I, once I get the subscription magazine uh, version of this magazine coming up, I, I've got to roll out there. This is something I want to see for myself yeah. and, and, you know, do an article on because, yeah. uh, you know, I'm familiar, obviously, with Paul, who yeah. Uh, yeah. a mutual friend. We haven't gotten on here yet, folks. You, you're you're, you're going to love this guy, too. Um, but he's the director of a similar program at UCLA, and it is right. incredible and massive. But you know, yeah. my understanding is that yours is even bigger and more massive. Well, and it's, it, 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 it is and it isn't. I mean, we, ours is an academic. So ours is for credit hours. So we, we do have right. a rec sports program as well. So we do have rec sports clubs. Uh, we do martial arts clubs in that environment. But this is actually in what's called the PAIP, which is the Physical Activity Instructor Program. Uh, so we teach our students. Uh, Early on, about the you know, about the martial art, uh, the training pedagogy, the methodology, uh, the culture, the, you know, the, the co- putting it into context. Then, as they go through the different classes, most of the classes will have three to four different levels. So, take you know, beginning class, intermediate, advanced, advanced two, and really by advanced, advanced two, you're actually learning how to start teaching the material. So, wow, we kind of we, we kind of pride ourselves on after two years of training. Now you kind of learn how to teach the basics to the people who are brand new. And so you, you really do get a chance to kind of, and that's where Paul came from is from this program is to really learn how to, you know, learn how to do and then right. learn how to teach it. You know? Right. 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 Yeah. So, yeah. And that's, a, I mean, that's a big push. It's like, uh, 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 even potentially sort of a Socratic method there because, uh, that's right. That's Jordan right. and Asanto, uh, had me, during the COVID period, because he likes to push this in the kids' class a lot. Uh, the the mm-hmm. best, uh, the highest form of learning is teaching, is yep. the quote that Agreed. he uses. And Agreed. he had me, uh, you know, gun and staples, and I made this huge poster size thing saying that. And he had me put it like reverse in the window, because during COVID, we were training outside in the parking lot. So it was like the one thing that he had me reverse put in a window, and I stuck it up pretty high, like in a window that we wouldn't even normally put something in. But Mm -hmm. because of the location of where we're out, you could see it really easily then from the outside. And now I've turned around and and now we're back inside. I put this big thing on the, essentially on the mirror right behind him. So, you know, it can be, be put out there. And of course I quiz the kids all the time, you know, uh, and as does he like, what's the highest form of learning? And they'll say, ah, teaching uh, who said it. And they know they, they look over and I said, your cheat sheets right there on the mirror. That's right. Right. It's It's, it's, it's a great thing. It is. It's it's a reminder. We, we, we talk about the, the triangle of learning here, you know, you, you first have to learn it uh, and then you need to do it and then mm-hmm. you need to teach it. If, you know, you, you don't know something until you can learn it, teach it or learn it, do it and then teach it. And, right. um, you know, it's the same thing with any academic endeavor, you know, what's two plus two? Well, if you don't know, you, you have to be taught it and then you have to go to the board and actually do the work. And then you really don't understand it until you can actually explain it to somebody who doesn't know it. And then, right. then it's, it's pretty good, pretty good proof that you know what you're talking about and, and uh, it, you, you've mastered that, at least the, the philosophy of it, if you can explain it well. So Right, right. Yeah. 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 It's, it's almost like uh, what you call evolutionary process. It's, you know, it's the passing on, right? Absolutely uh, right. Absolutely right. Yep. Because so much, so, many, so much of martial arts is, you know, oral tradition. Even now, it, well, it, although it's, it's recorded oral tradition now, but back in the day, it wasn't, you know, and, and being able to, to keep it consistent and, uh, and accurate and, uh, be able to to explain clearly without any type of loss in translation or loss of signal uh, was important, you know. Right. So now, what's interesting is your program also, uh, if I understand it correctly, there there is a an actual degree one can get in this, right? Um. Yes. Correct. Kind of. So it's a um the martial arts certificate. So it's just below a major, a bachelor's degree, but it's just above a a, a minor. So it's, it's oh, okay. kind of a, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's technically a significant martial arts studies. So it's, uh, it's a little bit more rigorous than a, than a minor, but uh, it's certainly not, 
not as comprehensive as, a, as an actual BS uh, degree, or a BA or BS degree. Wow, that's pretty cool. So, yep. what does do, does uh, a person that's looking for that certificate then do they do they specialize in a martial art? Uh, yeah, do they so, have to take uh, many yes. or? Yep. Yes, both. So, typically, what we do is we'll have, we have a set of four or five core classes: uh, structural kinesiology, uh, sport marketing management, um, exercise, a little bit of exercise science. Pardon me. Uh, so we have a couple of different core classes that we think you should know as a mar as a professional martial artist in today's in industry. Um, not only the biological, physiological standpoint of it, but also the business side of it, because it is a business. If you want to run it successfully, <laughs> if you want to and stay then, open, yeah, <laughs> yeah, if you want to stay open, uh, um, and then we have them specialize in one martial art. And right now, only because of what we offer here is somewhat limited. Uh, we offer them to specialize in uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Taekwondo, uh, Hapkido. We used to uh, allow them to specialize in, in Tai Chi Chuan, but our Tai Chi Chuan program has has diminished because our instructor left. Um, oh. And um, there's one other I think that we used to offer. But those are the, those are the, the three or four main big ones we have right now. And then what they do is so they have to specialize in that, i.e., get their black belt or black belt equivalents um, in that. Which is usually about, usually about two and a half years of of, of training, uh, basic, and then we also then require them to go in and focus on another martial art. So if you're taking, for instance, um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, then we want you to take at least a couple of classes of Judo and uh, Taekwondo, or uh, Tai Chi Chuan and uh, Qigong, or uh, foil fencing and you know, whatever. So just I mean, so it's not you're not focused on just Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. You, you understand mm -hmm. how it can be a, the principles can be applied to a different martial art. So you realize there's there are a lot of commonalities uh, in in teaching. Uh, and then we have them do one final like capstone, uh, and that's it. They have to kind of write write a kind of a summary report for us, and that's it. Wow. It yeah. was really, really, really cool. I, 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 I dig it. I, I dig the whole, yeah. I, I'm such a nerd into it. So I, that's why I really yeah. kind of dig that. Um, yeah. So here's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, so, you know, the, the approach here, obviously from a university is, is an academic yeah. uh, approach. And then, you know, we had just talked about martial arts having this oral tradition. So especially mm. out of uh, the East, cause I think about, you know, I got a pretty good background in humanities and, uh, English as well, which is, you know, literature and understanding and, and, and a huge interest in history. So um, understanding how a lot of cultures, especially non-Western cultures, non-British cultures, non-Roman cultures, okay. generally did not approach telling history or their history through exact events, exact dates, right. exact times, this, this sort of thing, um, more through myth. And so how yep. do you, from the academic uh, approach, look at mm -hmm. and deal with things like, uh, how should we say this? I don't want to say this in an unkind way, because I don't mean it that way, but the, the kind of mythological stories that are yeah. now being pushed as yeah. fact. Yeah, Just absolutely. Yeah. The, 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 the bullshit detector. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Thank I, you. I, Thank I mean, you. It, it's, it's true, I mean, but it's but it's true. Right. I mean, it's true. I mean, and well, one of the way we do it is we 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 call it what it is. I mean, th there's a lot of and I think we're all even those of us who try to be as progressive and as 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 modernized as possible. We still are guilty of pushing bullshit that and not maliciously. We just we just right. don't know it's bullshit until we realize it's bullshit. And hopefully, you know, everyone's ignorant until they're educated. So there's, there's nothing wrong with ignorance so long as you clarify it. And so right. we so one, we, we call it what it is. I mean, every semester I tell my students day one, hey, these are just my best case scenario opinions. I may be wrong. The way I teach it now is a lot different than the way I taught it back in 1992 when I first started teaching. Right. And, you know, one of the worst phrases in the human language or in the in English lang language is, well, we've always done it that way. I never <laughs> want to hear yeah. my student, right? I never want to hear my students say, well, we've always done it that way. Um, uh, that's that's a really shitty way of looking at, uh, at 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 anything. And so I tell my students, go, hey, look, 
I hope I'll learn something from you all this semester. And I hope that I won't teach this the same way next semester. Um, so I, I give them that, uh, that first caveat. And I tell them the biggest thing I want you to get out of this is critical, think, critical, critical thinking skills. Uh, what I'm going to give you is my best interpretation or idea of what we need to accomplish in this class. It's only the tip of the iceberg because it's only one class out of four that we can do. Um, a lot of things I'm going to teach you this semester will be counter to what I teach you in a few semesters on purpose um, because I'm giving you kind of a digested version in which to get into and then we'll, we'll make it much more complicated and you'll have to navigate it yourself. You know, uh, I'm, it's the difference between pedagogy and andragogy. The difference of pedagogy, I'm teaching it you know, as if they teach a child. So a person who comes in with no conceived, no preconceived notion versus mm -hmm. andragogy. I'm teaching an adult, a person who has an idea that is not clear on the subject matter. So instead of me leading them along like a child, I'm going to give them the tools they need and then send them on their way. Um, and so our beginning classes are very much of, of a pedago pedag pedagogical uh, approach. Our more advanced classes are much more andragogy, where it's just critical thinking, think for yourself, do for yourself. I'm here to guide you along. If I feel like you're getting off course, you're going to kind of put you back on course, or at least suggest that you might want to be on course yourself. Um, and so that kind of helps the students get their BS detector up and running. And then from a, from a academic point of view, as far as like the truth of, of, of the subject, um, we have pretty harsh discussions sometimes in class about what do we think about this? I mean, there are no, like you said, there are no, I don't want to say legitimate records, but there are no um, academically uh, right. um, peer-reviewed peer records. Uh, so <laughs> there's, there's nothing that would hold water in, an, in a peer review uh, out there on a lot of this stuff. So all we have to do is go on conjecture and speculation and, again, kind of pressure testing and proof of concept. You know, right. um, uh, And I, again, I find that sometimes the the european arts uh the fencing arts um and the swordplay arts because there are quite a few treaties on there a lot of it's in modern times either people are just drinking the kool-aid and refusing to go against what they've read there's something maybe lost in translation uh maybe it's just it's easier just to kind of go with what the book says and does um but then when they put it into use in competition or in sparring, the laws of physics prove them wrong. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> I mean, it, right? I mean, like, I mean, we, we see this a lot of times in jiu-jitsu and judo early on anyways. We had, we had all these, these crazy techniques that people would teach. And like, do the laws of physics allow that? I mean, let, let alone whether the person is cooperative or contesting or combative. Do the law do, do, does does leverage work that way? Well, it doesn't. Right. So why are we trying to why are we trying to put this person into this quarter turn lock when you're you're not biomechanically putting them into a lock? They're just they're submitting yeah. because they have been told to. So that's and I asked my students ago, you know, I want you to be honest with yourself. If the laws of physics, the laws that govern our universe, say it's not right, ask yourself why. Was the technique wrong? Maybe the technique was just wrong, or maybe your understanding of the technique was wrong, or um, but yeah, just don't, don't let bullshit ride just because it's the easy route, you know? Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. And then, um, you know, not only with the physical stuff, but even sort of with the origins and the influence and, yep, absolutely. Um, yep. you know, I, I was having a laugh the other day, just kind of, uh, looking at some of the issues that, you know, some of the Southeast Asian kickboxers are, are, are dealing with right mm -hmm. now. And it's a lot of it's pride and they're all trying to, you know, trying to say, oh no, this, this. Uh, Burmese art is completely a different thing than the Thai thing, which is completely different than the Cambodian. And you're like, okay, but we can historically show you this all is the same <laughs> empire at one time. Yeah. And yeah, they right. don't want to believe that people don't want to believe that right. that is the same thing, right. but yet right. they want to in the same breath, turn around and say, look at these very far North Alaskan Eskimos who stole this rest lock from judo. And you're like, right, wait, right. there's no way that wait. that group was ever exposed to this group. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, I, I think, I think it comes down to like, like you said, it does come down to a little bit ego. I mean, once we buy into something and we spend a lot of our time and I, I'm guilty of it too, spend, you know, decades of my life studying something only, only to realize that, Oh man, that's just kind of bullshit. 
Yeah. It's hard. It's hard. To, it's hard to go, man. That was a lot of time I spent. I mean, Hey, look, I had right. fun keep training it. I had a good time training. It. I got a lot of good friendships out of it, but I would never use it in a combative sense. So, right. you know, uh, but it's hard. I think it's hard for people to kind of put their ego to the side and say, hey, you make, okay. So I was wrong for 30 years. I mean, you know, it's only 30 <laughs> years, right? Um, versus, <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, totally. the, right. Because the longer you're in, the longer you're involved with something, the more you, in, you invest in it, the harder it is right. for you to admit that. Oh, okay, absolutely. Maybe it was a absolutely. And absolutely. Now, 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 when you start defining it as a culture, now you start identifying it as a cultural identity for yourself. And again, I'm not saying it's, that it's all bullshit, but uh, right. uh, you, you, just gotta, you just have to realize that, hey, it's not, it's like, going back around to what we we're saying earlier with the whole internet. The internet makes the world a very small, small place in a good way. Right. And sometimes you, you do realize that we're not all that different and we're not all that special as far as that. I mean, what we have in history and our culture, our personal cultures are very important to us. Mm -hmm. But just because, just because somebody else's culture is a lot more similar to ours than we originally thought doesn't make ours any less important to us. Right. Right. Exactly. It just makes it, it just makes them more similar to us, which is kind of a cool thing, I think. Right. Yeah. It's uh, you know, I, I, you know, I always talk about the thing that you've got on your wall back there, the duality, you know, where it's like something can be, yeah super special and not yeah. special at all at the same time at the same time yeah. I, I mean i mean absolutely <laughs> but again but again it's easier for us to i it gets into, into tribalism and everything else it just it makes it easier for us to go okay here's where we belong it's a lot easier for us to digest this one basic meal with very few ingredients this right. is where we belong this is this is what my tastes are this is what this is where i can i define myself in this box and if i were to open the box up uh, there's a lot more noise around me now. I, I feel less focused. And, um, you know, I think also with age, it just after a while, you just kind of realize, man, like, it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too tired to deal with this shit. Or what is it? Uh, I am. Mur 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 Murtog I am. from Lethal Weapon. I'm too old. That's right. I'm getting too old for this shit. <laughs> no, but, but, it's, but, it's but it's true. It's true in martial art training as well. Like, uh, you know, even in the same art. You go, you go to, from one gym to another gym. They, they teach, they may train, and they may have different pedagogy or different training methodologies. And this concludes the abbreviated version of the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast. Please click the like and subscribe buttons as well as the notification bell. Also consider subscribing to the full-length podcast at www.patreon.com slash malmag or purchasing individual full-length episodes at malmag.gumroad.com. Thank you for listening to this episode with Patrick Kelly. Coming up next week, an Aikido practitioner who is currently the editor of the classic Aikido journal, Josh Gold. Check out the Malmag store at www.martialartslifestylemagazine.com and click on the store tab. There, you will find a full selection of Timmy B's brand sticks for FMA and Kirby Kerbong, as well as Timmy B's and Dos Manos t-shirts. Many more products coming soon. Also click on our Courses tab to purchase online courses, right now featuring the course in the Dos Mono Stick of FMA. More courses to come. This show is produced by Martial Arts Lifestyle Magazine. Visit us at www.martialartslifestylemagazine.com and enjoy the free version of our online magazine with articles, a recommended schools page, and a worldwide events calendar. Music by Jack Al Relic. Martial Arts Lifestyle Magazine and the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast are trademarked and copyrighted by TNT LLC.